Assalamu alaikum. Today's topic is the kidneys. And our objectives today include learning about polycystic kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, which is actually an umbrella term comprised of multiple kidney diseases, which are long-lasting, and stage renal failure, and the treatment modality dialysis. We're looking at not only the clinical aspect, but also the gross parts, and as well as the CT scans and the histological slides. Now, the clinical scenario is this. A 10-year-old boy comes up to you, and you notice visible edema of his face. After examination, you also realize he has growth failure. His height is, not, uh, is lower than the norm of his age. And he also complains of his urine being darkish color or cola-colored urine is the term we use, classical term. And also there is a bit of flank pain on his side. All of these signs and symptoms are characteristic of a kidney disease. So when you send the boy for an ultrasound and an x-ray, then you pick up that the kidneys, some of the kidney, one of the kidneys looks shrunken or enlarged. Further testing shows on CT that one of the kidneys has so many lumps. This is polycystic kidney disease where one of the kidneys has all these cysts forming on it. Now, there are two varieties, the autosomal dominant, which is present in adults, and the autosomal recessive, which is found in children. So all of these cysts which are forming on the uh, kidney, they will interfere with its functions. And as time goes by, overall, the function will progressively fall down. So now in front of you is the nephron, the unit of the kidney. We can nicely see the afferent and the efferent arterioles. They're entering into the glomerulus. This is where the ultrafiltration happens. You see the glomerulus is surrounded by a Bowman's capsule. And from here we have the proximal convoluted tubule. The urine passes through here. And then into the loop of Henle, which is in the medulla. You can even appreciate the vasa recta here. From there we go up to the distal convoluted tubule. And from there into the collecting duct. This is the entire flow of the urine. But what's different here is the present presence of cysts. These cysts are actually going to cause trouble because they obstruct the flow of the urine as well as they compress the vessels. What will happen is that not only will you have uh, absence of uh, the ultrafiltration, no urine will be produced, but also the reabsorption from the urine which is produced, that will also be hampered. And this will then cause further trouble to the kidney. All of that backflow will then cause pressure and damage. You can even see the formation of stones. And this happens when there is stasis of the fluid. Any form of stasis can predispose to stone formation. This is how the polycystic kidney disease looks like microscopically. Here we have a CT scan of a patient with polycystic kidney disease. This was a boy. And here you can nicely see the two kidneys, the one on the right and one on the left, bean-shaped and they're whitish in color. But you can see all the cysts forming them. In the center, we have the vertebra and the muscles surrounding it. And there are so many cysts here, multiple cysts. Not only are they involving the kidney, but as well as the surrounding structures. Here is the liver. So this is basically polycystic kidney disease, which has involved the liver as well. And uh, again, this is the autosomal recessive variety, which is found in children. So as you examine further, we go upwards, we'll see that some of the cysts you can see in the liver as well as they're reaching upwards. But there's not much else to notice here. The kidneys is the main thing we're focusing on. And we can plainly see that the cysts have involved the kidney as well as the liver as well. Now this is a coronal section of polycystic kidney disease in an adult. We're going from the back side to the front. We can see the vertebral column. You can see all those vertebras and the muscles surrounding them, the pelvis at the bottom. And look over here. Two large sized kidneys. They're massively enlarged. They're not normally uh, this uh, large. And you can see all those lumps and cysts surrounding them. 
This is a polycystic kidney disease or somal dominant type in an adult. Let's check out the liver, if that is involved. The liver looks mostly fine. A few, um, and here down there is the kidney. You can see the liver is mostly fine. Other hypodense uh, regions are here. That, uh, but otherwise, it looks pretty much fine. And all the surrounding structures, the intestines. And as we go forward, there's not much else to see there. In the same patient, let's check out the axial uh, view. We'll start from the top. Here you can see the heart, the lungs. And uh, the, the heart and the lungs, when we see down here, is the liver. The liver looks mostly fine. But here, here are the two kidneys. And you can see, not only are they massively enlarged, but you can see all those lumps and the cysts forming in them. We go further down, there's not much to see here. You can see the two femur bones and the muscles, but we don't have to focus there. We're going to focus on the top, right over here. So when it comes to treatment, if polycystic kidney disease remains for a long time or any form of chronic kidney disease, it can lead to renal failure. The kidney stops working. If one stops working, there is compensation of the other one. But if both fail, then that patient will need dialysis. Dialysis is simply filtering of the blood through a machine, doing the function of the kidney, removing all those toxic wastes. And uh, to accomplish this, there, there's a prerequisite. The patient has to go a surgical procedure called AV fistula formation. This is one of the many uh, ways to before we can do dialysis, but the most common is AV fistula. What we do is, is that we make a connection between a vein and artery. Here we can see the radial artery and the cephalic vein. You can see how they've been fused together, they're connected together. The blood flowing through the artery immediately goes into the cephalic vein. This makes dialysis much more easier because we want all that unfiltered blood. And this unfiltered blood will then pass through the needle and the tubing and it'll go to the dialysis machine. All of this is the unfiltered blood from the cephalic vein. In the machine, it will be filtered and from there, it will pass to the second tubing and go back into the same cephalic vein. This is how the dialysis is done. So, from the artery and filtered blood, and from there we go to the cephalic vein. And the blood is taken from cephalic vein and put back into cephalic vein. Need not be the cephalic vein, you can use any other vein which is more easily accessible. But this is a thing that a patient has to live with for life in renal failure. And this was dialysis. Now let's get to the anatomy of the kidney. So first we'll orient the kidney. The kidney is a bean shaped structure. The curve, curved part must be facing laterally outside. While the part with all the vessels and the ureter, this is the hilum and this should be facing medially towards the inside. Obviously, you'll have a superior pole and inferior pole. During the viva, if students are having difficulty in orienting, just remember, the vein should be in front, the artery should be on the back, and the ureter points downwards. Like this, they can easily figure out which way is front, back, top, and bottom. When we cut the kidney and we see this coronal section, we'll notice that it has multiple parts, the outer cortex and the inner medulla. But in this medulla, we have these pyramidal shaped structures called the renal pyramids. And in between the pyramids are the renal columns. To zoom in a little further, you can see here, this is your pyramid and this is the column. This is the region where we have those nephrons which I previously showed you. Particularly the loop of Henle, which is going all the way down here. So, the urine from those nephrons at the start here, the proximal conduit tubule on the top side and going all the way down till the collecting duct, all the urine will exit through this end point of the pyramid known as the papilla. There's actually a hole in this region. If I were to change the angle, you might be able to see it. I hope you can appreciate this. Look how nicely you can see. Here we go. This is your papilla. It's at the end of the pyramid. The urine which is concentrated here is then passed through this hole into this space. Let me hide these vessels so you can see this space. This is your calyx. It's composed of two parts, the minor ones coming from the pyramids and they all coalesce to form a major calyx right over here. From the major calyx they'll enter into the pelvis of the ureter and from the pelvis of the ureter they'll flow down through the ureter 
and all the way to the bladder. The uter has its own anatomy and parts and uh, clinical. We'll do that one later. So in a nutshell, this was the gross anatomy of the kidney. But one more point I'd like to add are the vessels. You see, the renal arteries, as they come to supply the kidney, first you have the major and larger uh, renal artery. This will divide into interlobar arteries, arteries which are supplying the lobes. They're usually two to range almost up to nine uh, different uh, lobes of the kidney. So here are the interlobar arteries. The interlobar arteries will then divide into the arcuate arteries. The arcuate arteries are the one which are covering the top side of the renal pyramids. And from these you can see all these minor arteries coming out. These are the interlobular. First we had interlobar, then arcuate, then interlobular. And uh, in certain other uh, classifications they include a segmental one, but for now stick with this, renal artery, interlobar, arcuate, interlobular. And then obviously from the interlobular artery, we go into the interlobular vein, arcuate vein, interlobar vein, and finally renal vein. You can see how each uh, part of the interlobar is dividing into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's one on the back actually, that is your ninth one. This was the general anatomy of the kidney. To finish off, we'll be looking at a cut section of the kidney, an axial cut section. You can appreciate the cortex here on the outside and the medulla on the inside. If we zoom in on the cortex, we can then nicely see all the tubules present there, the proximal convoluted tubules, the distal ones, they're usually found in the cortex. Moving on to the medulla though, that's where we'll see the loop of Henle's here. You can see all these medullary rays. They are actually connected to the uh, proximal tubules and the glomerulus on the top and they will meet with the collecting duct at the end and all of that will go towards this region, the end of the pyramid known as the renal papilla and here all the filtered urine will come out into the minor calyx and exit. If we see the renal pelvis region, this is actually the dilated part of the ureter. So you can see how from the pyramids it exits into the minor papilla, the major papilla and from there into the pelvis. We can even appreciate some arteries present here. These are the arteries which surround the um, pyramids, the arcuate arteries. Now what I want to show right now actually is one renal corpuscle also known as the glomerulus and it's loading actually here, here we go, very nice. You can see multiple corpuscles. This is the glomerulus inside and the Bowman's capsule on the outside. This is where the ultrafiltration happens. And it is from here that the urine or the filtrate, uh, the urine, yes, then goes on to the tubules and exits at the end. So this is basically the a general overview of the histological slide of the kidney.